Sorry, boy. But his captain's got to teach his men what happens to those while crossing. Captain's got to teach stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good morning from the Bat Cave. It is Wednesday. Um, it is Wednesday, May 15th, 2024. And uh, I've just been working on a re edit of my uh, Revelation book. I'm about two thirds of the way done with that. Um, not really any major changes in it. If you guys already own the book, I just kind of, I just, I've been, I've, I've gotten uh, better at writing since completing my Rightly Dividing book. So I kind of rewrote the introduction and the preface and made that kind of a more, a more formal style like you would find in a lot of books, but not really saying anything different. Um, and then I'm just going through it and just, you know, looking, spell checking, looking for commas in the wrong place, things like that. So, um, but one of the things I did that I wanted to share with you guys, because remember I said I would do a video on the, uh, on, uh, Psalm 90 to kind of close off the, uh, Pentateuch because that, because that Psalm is by Moses and, uh, the other song that was by Moses, I'm actually going to fully put in a chapter in the book. It just worked out in the page count to fit the whole song in there, but that was the song that we read at the end of uh, Deuteronomy 32, uh, which is really all about the end times. It's about the dispersion of Israel all the way to the end times. So uh, we're going to talk about that briefly at the end, but I'm going to do Psalm 90 for you guys first and just kind of walk you through the, the uh, cosmology and the theology that's, that's written in there, okay? So uh, psalm 90 it says a, it's a prayer of Moses the man of God uh, this psalm gives you kind of quite a bit of cosmology and theology and history to it so I just want to walk you through it he says Lord you have been our dwelling place in all generations so he's saying we live inside of God okay now Paul's going to say something similar um, Solomon's going to say something similar but Paul's going to say very expressly he's actually going to use a Greek poem about Zeus to uh, illustrate that um, in God we live and move and have our being. And so if you guys have watched any of my older stuff, um, you've seen me use this model here of basically the, the cosmology and the Godhead. And um, think of God as this like black hole that's bigger than the universe and the universe is inside him. Well, um, the, the cosmos, or this is you know the created order, that's what cosmos means, um, but I'm just gonna call it the universe it kind of has these three layers to it. So it's got the earth, it's got the, the um, what we would call the heavens it, as the sky is the first heaven, what we would call uh, outer space is the second heaven, and um, the heaven, heaven of heavens, or the third heaven, which is where the angels dwell when they're not active here in the, in the creation. <clears throat> it's also where God's throne room is in the book of Revelation. These layers are kind of modeled on uh, the tabernacle in reverse. So um, if you think of the tabernacle, you have an outer courtyard, and that's where people dwell. That's where the sacrifices take place. That's where the, um, the, the washing takes place, and then they go into the inner sanctuary. Well, if you go into the inner sanctuary, the tabernacle, it's, it's blue. I think it's like blue, blue and purple, but I think it's mostly blue. And they've got all these angels sewn into basically the the cloth work to kind of look like stars, but they're angels. Um, so that's kind of outer space. Well, stars and angels are kind of reflections of each other. And I kind of have a theory that um, behind the stars, if we're getting trans-dimensional here, there's actually a angels watching us from heaven. And that's, that's what's going on in the stars. And obviously it's in a space-time fabric. That's how we've learned to describe it. But in the tabernacle, it's an actual fabric with angels sewn and in, embroidered into it, okay? So you go into that second layer, and then uh, the Holy of Holies would, would be like going to where God actually is, where his presence actually is. And so God doesn't actually look on sin. He's out here. He's separate from sin, and um, he has kind of an angelic um, condescension of himself sitting at the throne room of heaven, which we see in the book of Revelation. Uh, the lamb's there, the seven spirits are there, and then the old man on the throne is the father, okay? And um, he, he basically is given a reports of sin from the angels. He doesn't actually interface with sin himself. Uh, the Holy Spirit and the Son do in the creation because they go all the way to the depths of Sheol, okay? But he does not. So it's kind of reverse of that and think about how out here God is a consuming fire clothed with thick darkness. Well, you can never get to interface with God directly 
unless you're covered in the blood of Christ, that's what makes you able to stand that. And obviously we're going to get a new, uh, basically a heavenly body or a a angelic body like what Christ had in the resurrection. That's what's going to make us be able to stand in the presence of God. And, um, And it's the same thing when you enter in the Holy of Holies. If the priest is unclean or has sin on them, they're going to drop dead when they enter in the Holy of Holies. So you want to kind of start to look at the tabernacle like your universe, and then it's also the reverse of that is inside of you. And this is this is why, as Christians, the Holy Spirit doesn't leave us even though we continue to sin. is because there's almost like a protective layer between where the Holy Spirit resides in us. We're going to call this our heart of hearts, but it's, it's the Holy of Holies. And then um, the, our flesh where we sin, that, that uh, protective layer is kind of our born-again inner man. So our born-again inner man... Um, doesn't actually sin, but our flesh sins and our soul kind of transverses between the flesh and the inner man. And that's why, you know, it's important for us to understand our flesh as having a will of its own and our inner man having a will of its own and us left to decide which one of these wills am I going to let dominate in my decision making throughout the day. Just like Christ says, not my will, but thy will be done. We die daily. Remember, Christ is making the decision to die when he said that. We die daily as we make that decision and um, basically choose to sin or, or not to sin. We're, we're constantly in that battle, and sometimes we get emotional and we, we react immediately, but we have a choice to um, repent and put off sin and put to death sin or to walk in it, okay? So it's like we're we're kind of a tabernacle, the universe is kind of a tabernacle, and then um, God and the cosmology are kind of a tabernacle. So kind of look at it like that, okay? So <clears throat> that's the model we're looking at, and you see God is out here, and within him is the cosmos, and that includes both space and time. Now, the third heaven still has space-time, but it might have different rules of time here, so the angels might be able to speed up or slow down time, or um, they might be able to intersect with time at different places and at different paces than we do here. Um, It's hard to tell, but when you see in the book of Revelation, um, you're going to see John intersecting with what's going on in heaven and what's going on in earth. And you got to remember, the book of Revelation is going to carry you from before Christ's death and resurrection to the end of eternity. So, Um, It's actually, John is actually going to be in heaven in in this vision, and part of what he's doing is back in time for him. Other parts are going to be throughout the age of the church. Other parts are going to be the end times, um, the the end of this age, and then other parts are going to be at the end of the millennium, and then into eternity. So um, think of of, um, basically John's vision in heaven covering somewhere around 3,000 years, but what he's actually physically watching is going to take place over a couple days. Well, that's because what he says here is, Before the mountains were, were brought forth, and ever you had formed the earth of the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, from eternity to eternity, you are God. So um, th- this model of the earth that, you know, the Greeks kind of have it too, most of the world has it, is kind of this spherical model um, where it's understood that, you know, space and time is kind of, this sphere, um, that's why they call they would call the different heavens or the different layers spheres. And within this sphere, time goes on. And in the outermost sphere, God is there. And what we if we were to go back in time or to one end of space or forward in time or to the other end of space, um, we're going to run into God. Okay? God is not there's no such thing as eternity past. Um, What we would call eternity past is just God. What we would call eternity future is just God. So from eternity to eternity, you are God. So he he dwells alone in eternity. Um, Nobody can really go outside of where he is. There's there's just the outer darkness, which is just a void, which is essentially the outer presence of his burning, radiant glory um, and the nothingness that's outside of that. Okay? So from eternity to eternity, he is God. And then he says, you turn man to destruction. This word here is like um, crushing them to powder. So you turn man to powder and say, return, O you children of men. So in other words, he returns men to the dust because he, everything to him is like instantaneous. Like 
watch how he says this, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. So we would slowly decode from you know our creation to our decomposition back to dust, but to God that's like instantaneous, okay? It's just like going, okay? He says, you carry them away as with a flood, they are as asleep in the morning, uh, they, they are like grass which grows up in the morning, it flourishes and grows up, and in the evening it cuts down and it withers, okay? So he's like he kind of comparing that to what we see when the grass is cut and then it just suddenly decomposes or it's just, just cut down. Um, kind of like, I mean, what these guys would experience is their animals going over it and just eating all the grass, but it's like kind of like it grows up and then it's just gone, okay? Um, it's like that. He says, for we are consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we are troubled. Um, you set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance, for our days are all passed away in your wrath. We spend our years as a tale. So, so you see at, that is told is not in there, but as a tale, a tale implies that it's told. A tale is, is, is like a, an old English version of the word tell. You tell a tale, and a tale is told. Um, so it's like a, a, our, we spend our years as like a story. It's like you telling a story, um, and you know how when you tell a story, a lot of time can pass. But you you know a movie could go on, and that movie could pass over days or months or years, but it's going to take place over two hours. It's like that. That's what our life is. Okay. For the days of our years are three score years and ten, so seventy years. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet it is strength. Um, yet their strength. Yet their strength is labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. What is he saying? He's saying, if you live to be older, those last years are going to be even harder than the years you have. Okay, so if you die at 70, you die in pretty good shape, okay, assuming you take care of your health. But if you live to be 80, you're going to watch your, your body suddenly fall apart. This is why most people are retired by 70. The goal is to retire and have years that you can enjoy while you still have your legs and while you still have your eyesight and all this stuff. And if you live to 80, I mean, there are people, I used to go to church with this lady who was like in her 90s and still drove. If you really take good care of yourself, you can keep going. But it's harder and harder and harder, okay? He says, so their labor and sorrow. Why is it sorrow? Because all your friends are dying. I mean, I, if you if you get to know elderly people, you realize this looks like everybody I used to know is dead. It is very sorrowful. It's very depressing to realize that all your friends you grew up with, all your brothers are dead. Your parents are dead. Most of your friends are dead. Your husband or wife is dead. And you're down to your kids and grandkids. And they bring you joy. But every, all your peers are gone. It's, it's just a hard, hard point of existence. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. So notice it's saying our lives are cut off and we fly away, okay? Our soul departs our body. We fly away. Where do we go? Well, um, Solomon's going to talk about this. Um, do we go up or do we go down? Well, we go to Sheol or we go to Abraham's bosom, okay? Um, Abraham's bosom seems to be in Sheol or it seemed, there seems to be a distinction between the two places, but they both seem to be in this underworld where we go and await um, salvation. Of course, now if we're in Christ, um, we go straight to heaven. We don't have to, we, we pass go, collect 200, okay? Um, so it says, who knows the power of thine anger? Even according to your fear, so is your wrath. Or I'm sorry, yeah, even according to your fear, so is your wrath. I don't think God's afraid. Let's see what he says here. New RSV says, your wrath is as great as the fear that is due, due to you. So I don't think he's saying your fear. And they're saying the fear that is due to him. So he's saying, who, who knows the power of your anger? So basically, as much as we're supposed to fear God, that's how um, bad his wrath is. Okay, he's really as scary as it seems. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent you uh, concerning your servants. So notice this idea of God returning and having gone somewhere um, is present in Moses. Well, why? Um, well, he's forecasting Christ leaving and returning, but you want to remember in another sense, 
God used to dwell with man in the Garden of Eden. They used to walk with him in the cool of evening and talk with him, and they've lost that um, personal relationship with God to that degree. Now he comes and talks to them through the Spirit. Occasionally he shows up as the angel of the Lord, but it's extremely rare. And um, and this is the reason man's ears are dwindling, okay? So satisfy us early with your mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. Make us glad according to the days where you have afflicted us and the years that we have seen evil. So notice he's saying make us glad according to the days. So life is short. Be glad that it's short, okay? He's afflicting us. The point that our lives are short and miserable is kind of a punishment for the fall, okay? Be glad that, that he's shortening them. That's to our benefit. If they were longer, we'd have more years to screw up and accumulate more judgments. We wouldn't fear God the way we should, and this, which is why when they lived to be a thousand, they ended up murdering each other all over the place. They had, they, they had years of living without real strong consequences for sin. And he's saying, be glad that God shortened our days. This is to our benefit. So let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. Let the beauty of the Lord be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. Okay. So remember what is said about Judah in when um, when Moses is giving the different um, prophecies about those. He says um, about Judah, let his hands be sufficient for him. Okay. Well, the work of our hands, obviously, he's not saying, I, well, he, he, he can, in a sense, he could establish the work of our hands because those things that are done in faith, we are going to get a reward for. Everything else is just going to be burned up, okay? Um, but he's also talking about Christ, who's one of us. He puts on human flesh, so he's one of us. And the work of his hands, which is his crucifixion, um, becomes sufficient for our salvation, so notice he's saying, let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. Okay, what's happening? Well, Jesus is going to put on human flesh and establish the work of our hands. Well, Jesus is going to be our head where Adam was our head. And the work of his hands are going to give us eternal life. Okay. Um, so this, all this right here is kind of talking about Christ. Okay. So... Obviously, the big one that we pull out of here that is going to be used in other places, Peter's going to use uh, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years, okay? This idea, just, just so you guys know, if you're dealing with people who are against the millennium or against this thousand-year day theory, remember, we know for certain, we don't know how long this has been around, but I know for certain it was in the Book of Jubilees, which was written after the Maccabees, Okay. Not long after the Maccabees, and I know this is all the way in Irenaeus, which was around 200 AD. Okay, so you're looking at a period of about 400 years, and right in the middle of those 400 years is the ministry of Christ and the New Testament being written, in which this day is a thousand years, seven years, seven thousand, uh, seven thousand years, seven day theory is being used by both Jews and Christians. Okay, um. In that context, in the Book of Jubilees, this is actually cited in my Revelation book here, um, they're going to talk about uh, Adam's day being um, shy, just shy of a thousand years, and that's why he dies on that day, which is, you know, I, I got this from Scripture, but I found it in the Book of Jubilees afterward, okay? And then uh, the other one is they're going to talk about people's lives being extended. He, he doesn't call it the millennium, but to nearly a thousand years in the future Messianic reign, which, which means... Well, if their lives are getting extended to nearly a thousand years, then the millennium has to be, or the, the messianic reign has to be a thousand years, okay? So the idea of a millennium has also been around from at least 200 years before uh, Christ came to at least 200 years after, um, and that's when they start to get into amillennialism, okay? So those are the OG positions, um, just so you know, and you want to use the Book of Jubilees uh, down through Barnabas and Irenaeus as kind of your proofs for that, okay? So um, a day being like a thousand years, obviously he creates the earth in seven days, and those seven days represent 7,000 years. You're going to have right around the first thousand year mark, Noah is born, right around the second thousand year mark, Abraham is born, around the third thousand year mark, David is born. Around the 4,000-year mark, Christ is born, okay? And so those are your four major covenants for humanity. 
the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and then obviously the new covenant. And what's not on that thousand year time scale is the old covenant. The old covenant is going to come around 1400 BC. Okay. Um, and it's going to really last until Christ is um, killed and they're going to buy their way out of it. That's in Zechariah. And we'll go over that again and again and again. Okay. So, so that's Psalm 90. My theory is that Moses probably wrote Psalm 90 in the book of Numbers because people would have been dying a shorter time span. Remember, Moses and his fathers lived to be around 120. Um, Joshua and uh, Caleb, it's a big deal that they're 80 and 90 when they go into the promised land. Okay, so um, the fact that the end of the Bible is making a big deal about the fact that they're 80 and 90 going into the promised land. Remember, this is written after Moses is dead. This is in Joshua. Well, in, when Moses dies, he's 120 and his eyes not dimmed, okay? He's part of a generation that's still living longer, but he's witnessing people die at around 70 to 80 after that, okay? So he knows all these people from, from the immediate generation, and, and a lot of these people are from his own generation, who normally would live to be 120 like he, he would. Um, and they're all dropping that 70 to 80 now. So I think this he writes this in the book of Numbers. And then in the book of Deuteronomy, he's going to do this last prayer. And I actually did my own, um, kind of my, my own rendition of the King James, kind of like what I did with my apostles teaching. And I just want to read this to you because it's interesting. I slap it at the end of this chapter and I didn't realize that he is telling you in Deuteronomy 32 that the guy who lifts up lifts up his hand and says, may the Lord live forever in the book of Revelation and in Daniel 12, so that's going to be Revelation 11 and Daniel 12, is Christ himself. So I want to show you this, okay? So he says, this is Moses speaking to open this up. He says, give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, uh, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as, as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, and the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass, for I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. They have corrupted themselves. Their mark is not the mark of his children. Okay, this has an end times connotation on it. Their mark is not the mark of his children. Remember, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit in our foreheads. They're marked with the mark of the beast, okay? They are a perverse and crooked generation. <clears throat> do you by this benefit the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is not he your father who has, bu who has bought you? Has he not made you and established you? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you your elders and they will tell you. When the Most High divided the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set boundaries of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land, in a howling wilderness waste. He led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirs up her nest and flutters over her young, spreads abroad her wings, takes them and bears them on her wings, so the Lord led him, and there was no strange God with him. Remember how Jesus says, Oh, I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chickens, okay? He made him ride on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields. And he made him to suck the honey out of the rock, the oil from the artist's stone, the butter of cows and milk of sheep with the fat of lambs and rams and goats of the breed of Bashan, um, with the fat hearts of wheat and for drink the pure blood of the grape. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You are grown fat and thick and you have become sleek. And he forsook the God which made him and withdrew the, from the rock of his salvation. So notice he is, he's going from basically the wilderness to now they're in the promised land, okay? And basically they get rich off of all the stuff that they didn't plant and um, establish. Um, and then um, they're going to forget God, okay? They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. They provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons and not to God. To... Um, to gods they knew not, new gods that arose recently, whom your fathers feared not. Remember, in the in the era where the Jews are falling into these new gods, a lot of these gods are um, going to be newly created. Remember, they go into Egypt around the time of the Tower of Babel, 
and most of the ancient quote unquote gods we have um, arose in that time. So some of the earliest gods we have are going to be gods like Ninurta, which is based on Nimrod. Okay, and he is be going to become um, he's going to become uh, Apollos. Um, he's not going to become Zeus. I, I have a theory that Zeus and Baal and Thor. They're actually all born of the Lord appearing in the storm in Job. So remember um, that that God, Baal, is going to be the original. That is going to arise around the um, Aramean area um, and, and the area of um, north, northern Canaan. Well, Job is in the land of Uz, and he's talking to Abuzai Elihu when the Lord shows up, which means he's probably in that Aramean reason. U Uz and Buz are going to actually be descendants of Abraham's brother. Okay? Um, so they're called huzz and buzz in the Bible, but ooze and booze. Okay. So there's, there's, there's a ooze, who's, and then there's a ooze, uh, who's a descendant of Edom, but that guy would have been too young for Job to be dwelling in a land named after him. So, um, the other one is going to be basically, um, I think they're like the grandkids of Abraham's older brother and they might even be his son. So they're going to be roughly contemporary with Isaac. So by the time Job comes around, it's going to be like 200 years later, um, so, so they're going to be um, dwelling in his land, and the Buzite is going to be of that family um, who's talking to Job, okay? And the Lord shows up in like a tornado storm, okay? And it's out of that where the Lord becomes described as the Lord of storms and lightning and all this stuff because of how Job sees him, okay? Well, that those attributes are going to eventually come to Baal, which just means the Lord, okay? Remember, Job doesn't have the name Jehovah because that name is given to Moses for the first time when he's wandering in the wilderness. So even though this, in the story of Job, he uses Jehovah for the, the Lord, Job didn't know him as Jehovah, okay? Job is actually calling God El, which is the singular El, El, Eloah, which is uh, the singular for God. Um, and uh, he's calling him the Lord, but more than likely, what these guys would have used was the word Baal for the Lord because, um, or maybe, maybe something like Adonai, but Baal, Baal meant the Lord or the master or whatever. And it seems to be that's where a Baal comes from. Well, what you have is these slow corruptions of these guys. And now you've got somebody who becomes Zeus and somebody who becomes Apollos running around. Okay. So the point that I'm making to you is that by the time the Jews get out of Egypt and start going into the promised land, they have the Apis bull, and the Egyptians do have their different gods that have developed over that time, but most of the pantheons of gods are based around ancestor worship and corruptions of the divine godhead, the real godhead. And so you'll find in like the Epic of Gilgamesh, um, you, a divine father and a de divine mother, and I think they're called Enlil and, I want to say Enlil and Ninlil. I forget what the feminine is called, but there's a divine, there's a, she's considered a goddess of wisdom and a, and a divine father. So a, a divine mother and a God, divine father. Okay. And that I believe is their version of the father and the Holy Spirit. And then um, the Lord seems to be, there seems to be two competing Lords floating around the Middle East. One is going to be Ninurta, who's like an Antichrist. And Baal is kind of like Christ. He's kind of this God of the storm who showed up for Job. Okay. Well, Baal um, is actually used in the Bible one time for the Lord, okay? So it's almost like he's letting him know, like, that's that's me, okay? Um, but then who Baal is and what he's like and his attributes and his character and all this stuff change over time, and he becomes Zeus and Thor. He's this corrupt god who sleeps with people because the region that it emerges in and the region that starts to worship Baal is the same place where the Nephilim come back, Okay. And so this idea of this God coming down and sleeping with women and then making these demigods, which is where they get Hercules, which is a corruption of Samson, um, that's where all this stuff comes from. So the point is, is these are all new gods. They didn't exist when, when Israel went into Egypt, and now they're these newly created gods, and they're worshiping them, okay? Um, so he says, they sacrificed to demons and not to God, uh, the God whom they knew not, new gods that arose recently, whom your fathers feared not. The rock that bore you, you have not remembered and have forgotten the God that formed you. When the Lord saw it, he despised them because the because of the provocation of his sons and daughters. He said, I will hide my face from them and I will see what their end will be. For they are, are a very perverse generation, children in whom there is no faith. In other words, it's, whenever God's not doing miracles from them, they instantly turn away. 
Okay, they, they fear him when he's doing miracles for them, but as soon as he's done, they turn away from him, okay? They have moved me to jealousy by that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. So I will move them to jealousy by those that are not a people, and I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. And this is where the church comes in, okay? So for those of you, this I'm going to both deny and affirm a kind of replacement theology here, okay? For those of you who are against the idea that God turned away from Israel towards the church, remember, he flat out says he's going to do that. Years before Jesus, okay? This is 1,400 years before Jesus. He flat out says he's going to provoke them to jealousy by those which are not a people. In Zechariah, he's going to tell them he breaks his covenant with them. In um, Jeremiah, he's going to say that he divorces northern Israel. In Hosea, he's going to say that he's going to return to his place till they acknowledge their offense. Now, this is not permanent, but he does for a time reject Israel, send them out, basically curse them, and he's going to curse them until they finally acknowledged their offense, okay? Um, and that's going to come when they're provoked to jealousy by, it says, them that are not a people. In other words, the church is not a singular people group. We are called Christians. That is our nation. So, you um, Michael Rood fans and you Hebrew Roots people who think that the word Christian is a pagan term, that name was given to them by God in the book of Acts. When you see that it says they were first called Christians at Antioch, that word called, if you look at the Greek, that word is always used for divine revelation. It means they're divinely called Christians. So God called them all Christians. That is our nation. That is our people. Um, but in terms of the nations of the earth, we are not a national people group like the Jews were, okay? So we're going to be, they're going to be provoked to wrath by people who don't exist as a single people group, and they're, they're, they're called a foolish nation. Why? We speak in a bunch of different languages. This is a dumb nation. We don't even have a national land. We don't have a national language. What's, what's up with us? So, well, we have a king who speaks all languages, so we're good. For a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn to the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with their increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap calamities on them. I will spend my arrows upon them. So he's kind of fast forwarding to the destruction of the earth before the new heavens and new earth here. Okay. But um, so he kind of goes from his promise to cast out Israel which is really going to ultimately happen at the rejection of Christ in 70 AD, and then provoking them to jealousy, which is going to happen um, really in the rapture. Okay, And now he's just jumped up to uh, the final destruction of the earth. He says, I will heap calamities on them. I will spend my arrows on them. Remember, Zechariah is going to say that the Lord shoots uh, arrows like lightning. Okay, They shall be consumed with hunger and devoured by burning heat and with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them, and the poison of serpents of the dust, okay? Um, remember the um, beasts, the chimeras that kind of come out in Revelation uh, 9 from the kings of the east. So you're going to have these 200,000 of these uh, beasts with teeth and um, serpents for tails that are afflicting everybody, okay? I believe those are crushing world governments, but we'll see. The sword, the sword without and terror within shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling along with the man of gray hair. So these um, kings are going to drive all the Jews from the ends of the earth back to the promised land where it's safe. Okay. I said I would scatter them to the corners. I would make a remembrance of them cease from among men were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy that perhaps their adversaries should behave themselves ignorantly and say, our hand is exalted, and the Lord has not done this. So he's saying, if my destroying Israel, destroying the Jews, um, would not lead the Gentiles to say, God didn't destroy them, we destroyed them, um, this is why he's going to get jealous for them. Not because of them, not because they're good, but for his name's sake. And he's going to say this again and again and again. Remember, Moses talks about destroying Israel three times, okay? For they are a nation devoid of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they considered their latter end. Remember, he said, let's see how their end is, okay? Well, he's talking about the ultimately the time of Jacob's trouble. This is the end of Israel and when he finally rescues them, okay? So he does not stay angry at them forever. He does curse them for a time, and then he turns around and blesses them, okay? 
Um, he gets them to a point where they're humbled and then the Gentiles are exalted against them, like what you have with Assyria, um, you know, basically acting like he's defeated all the gods, okay? Um, and then he's going to go, no, 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 you're getting uppity now. Now i got to put you down. So he says, although they were wise, that they understood that they considered their latter end, how could one chase a thousand or two put ten thousand to flight unless their rock had sold them and the Lord had surrendered them? So remember, whenever you see this word Lord here, this is going to be Yahovah, okay? This is his actual name, okay? As even our enemies themselves do judge. So in other words, Israel, you should know God is against you. Even your enemies can see that, okay? Now, right now, Israel isn't feeling that way. And Israel is feeling like they can take on the world, okay? This is part of their final chastening is the making them feel like they can take on the world so that they allow the Antichrist to come up among them, okay? What's going on right now with Israel is God is allowing Israel to get puffed up with pride by allowing them to have victory over their enemies, but then they're going to get the Antichrist because they're not going to turn to Christ. And then when that has been exhausted, this is all in Micah 5, um, then God is going to come rescue them, okay? So he says this, For their rock is not as our rock, they have a false rock is even our enemies do judge. For their vine, remember Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Their vine is the vine of Sodom. And their field, the field of Gomorrah. Remember, they've got the land, but they're not really dwelling in the land in, in freedom because God has delivered them. They've done this by themselves. The Zionist movement, even though it's a fulfillment of a prophecy, the Zionist movement to resettle the land, the Jews have pretty much done on their own. God hasn't really done it, okay? Um, he is the, the ultimate establishing of them in their land is the millennium. Okay. So it's going to happen. And what they're doing is just like Abraham, I mean, these are the descendants of Abraham. They try to do it by their own strength. They make a mess out of things and then God does it the right way. Okay. Um, it's how we are as humans. Okay. We always, God says, I'm going to do this. And I'm like, okay, I got you. You want me to do that? And I'm like, no, 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 no. He said, I'm going to do that. Okay. Their grapes are the grapes of gall, their clusters bitter, their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Remember, this, these are going to be in the Psalms and in, and in um, Romans 9. He's talking about the Jews here. This is, this is what they, he, remember how he said if he hadn't left them the remnant, they'd be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, this is where he's getting it from. It's going to be in Isaiah and Hosea and these other prophets later. Is this not laid up in my store and sealed up among my treasures? In other words, what the Lord is saying is, his word, remember his, um, Jesus is going to say a scribe of the kingdom takes from his treasure things new and old, okay? His store and his treasures are things that he wrote down that are going to come to pass, okay? So he's saying all the stuff that's happening, didn't I say it was going to be like this? Um, is this not in my store and sealed up in my treasures? In other words, didn't I write this down and store this up so you'd remember later? To me belongs vengeance and recompense. All the stuff that's going on is God's doing. Their foot shall slip in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them come quickly. For the Lord shall judge the, his people. Now notice he's saying they'll, they'll slip in due time. Now he's talking about the Gentiles getting theirs. Okay, All of this was talking about the Jews. Now he's talking about the Gentiles who are getting uppity. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things shall come upon them shall come quickly. For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants when he sees that their power is gone. Remember, the church, he doesn't call servants, he calls them friends, but Israel are his servants, okay? When he sees that their power is gone and there is none left to deliver, and he says, where are their gods, their rock in whom they trusted, who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank their wine of their drink offerings? In other words, those gods they were sacrificing to, are they, are, are you done with them now? I can you see that they don't have any power to deliver you, okay? Once you're done with them, okay, then I'm going to mock you, and then I'm going to come help you. He goes, let them rise up and help you and be your protection. Understand now, it's going to say, see now, or understand now that I, even I am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any any that could deliver you out of my hand. This, this is going to be in Hosea 5 and 6, okay? He's going to reference that, okay? He's going to, he's going to wound and he's going to heal, Okay? For now, listen, listen, listen to this. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. Okay, now he's saying, This is me. I lift up my hand and say, I live forever. Okay, 
Well, we're going to see this in uh, Daniel 12. So in Daniel 12, when he's talking about um, how long is it going to be till the end of these wonders, he's taking them to the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week. Remember, he's saying right now, their mark is not the mark of my children. In other words, they're, they're implementing the mark of the beast already, okay? In Daniel 12, he's, he's saying, how long till these wonders? And he says, and one of them, oh, he said, one of them said to the man clothed in linen who was upstream. So this man clothed in linen is Jesus. And Daniel's going to fall on his face and bow down and touch the earth. And the man's going to touch him and heal him. Okay. He says, how long shall it be till the end of the, uh, these wonders? And the man clothed in linen who was upstream raised his right hand and his left hand towards heaven. So he's like this long. Okay. It's this many. And I heard him swear by the one that lives forever that it will be a time, two times, and half a time. And when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things will be accomplished. Okay? So notice he's, he's, he's going until um, the power of Israel is destroyed and they have no more hope in their own hands. Okay? And then he says, I lift up my hand forever and say, I live forever. Well, here he says um, he lifts up his right hand and his left hand. And he says, he swears by the one who lives forever. Well, here he's saying, I live forever, okay? Why? Because that's the Lord doing this, okay? Now in Revelation chapter 11, this is going to be at the midpoint of, um, right right before the seventh trumpet is going to sound, or I'm sorry, chapter 10. And this angel is going to come down and this angel is going to say, um, the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and raised his right hand to heaven. Now, I'm going to show you the description of this angel and show you that it is the Lord, okay? This is the angel of the Lord before Christ comes physically back to earth, okay? He says, I saw another mighty angel coming down out of heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head. His face was like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire, okay? People are going to be like, that's Michael. Well, that's what I thought when I wrote the first version of this book, but it's actually in Ezekiel 1, okay? He says... When he's talking about the wheels within wheels and all these things on the throne, he says this. He said, upward from what appeared like the loins, I saw something like gleaming amber, something that looked like fire enclosed all around. And downward from what looked like the loins, I saw something that looked like fire. And there was splendor all around, like a bow in the cloud on a rainy day, which was the appearance of the splendor all around. And this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell on my face, just like Daniel does with the man in linen, and I heard the voice of someone speaking, okay? So this guy with a rainbow over his head, is the, it represents the glory of the Lord, okay? So the point is, now we get back to Revelation uh, uh, 10, and this guy is holding the little scroll in his hand. Why? Who is worthy to take the scroll? The Lamb, okay? So this is the angel of the Lord now holding the open scroll, and this scroll is in Ezekiel 3. Again, all this is in my Revelation book. It represents, it's in, in Zechariah 5 and Ezekiel 3. And those, those two prophets are writing within about 70 years of each other, okay? And it contains the judgment against Satan and against the world, okay? And it, it's, it's what's giving Christ the go-ahead to start judging the world, okay? So, that guy, when he lifts up his hand to heaven, he's going to say this. The angel who I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever. Remember, uh, he's already said, I swear by myself. The one who lives forever and ever is himself, okay? Who created heaven and what is in it and what is in it and the sea and what is in it. There will be no more delay, okay? It's time. There's no more delay. Well, what was delayed? Well, the delay was in the wrath. He was, remember, he closes, he closes Luke 4 halfway through the sentence and leaves out the part about the wrath. He pressed the pause button on Daniel 70 weeks, okay? And the point of the wrath, um, he, he delayed. Now, Christ is gonna do that at the beginning of his ministry, and he's, uh, he's saying, I pressed the pause button on the delay. Well, now the wrath is no longer delayed. But in the days when the seventh angel is to blow his trumpet, then the mystery of God will be fulfilled as he declared to his servants the prophets. Well, what's the mystery? Well, that's the Gentiles who become one body with Christ, and that's how the Jews are made jealous by them, okay? So, he's going to say this, and now listen what the Lord says. I will lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever, 
If I wet my glittering sword and my hand takes hold to judge, I will render vengeance to my enemies and reward them that hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood. Remember, he shoots lightning like arrows. That's how he's going to take out the Antichrist. And my sword shall devour flesh and the blood of the slain and the captives from the beginning of my vengeance upon the enemy. The Lord is come, going to come down. The first thing he's going to do is go to Basra and slaughter everyone who's trying to get the Jews who are safely dwelling there. Okay? So... This is what the Lord is describing as the beginning of his vengeance, okay? Rejoice, o, o nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and render vengeance upon his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and unto his people, okay? Now, your people who don't think this is the future for Israel are retarded because they don't know Deuteronomy. Now, it's not just Deuteronomy. This is in Deuteronomy. This is in Hosea. This is in Jeremiah. This is in Isaiah. This is in Zechariah. This is in Joel. This is in Amos. It's over and over and over again that God is going to scatter the Jews throughout the nations. Then he's going to make them jealous by a people who um, aren't even a nation. And those are the Gentiles. And then, after that, he's going to have mercy on his land and on his people. He's going to bring the Jews back to the promised land in full, in safety, in peace with himself as Lord over them. Okay? You can't read the prophets without seeing this. So anyone who's just like, oh, that's Israel worship. No, it's God worship. God says he's going to do this. And at no point in time does he say, well, this is just figurative. Mm -mm. Nor is he going to say, yeah, this is fulfilled when some of the Jews came back from Babylon and had this tiny little Judea. No, he details what it's going to be like. He's like, here's where all the 12 partitions of the land for the 12 tribes will be. Here's where the temple is going to be. Here's what the law is going to be when it is that day. Okay, and all you people who have a problem with this and think it's Israel worship or this is some kind of Zionist thing, you need to understand. Just because the Jews are trying to accomplish by their own strength what God said he would do, that's all part of the plan. God is allowing all this because when their strength is exhausted, he's going to come and save them. And he's going to put down the Gentiles and he's going to judge everybody. But when he finally comes to do that, he is going to rule, rule from Jerusalem and the Jews are going to dwell in the promised land. That is part of his eternal promise, okay? Now, is it going to be like that in the new heavens and new earth? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe in the new heavens and new earth there's like going to be a greater, bigger version of the promised land. I don't know. Maybe. We'll see. The New Jerusalem is much bigger than the Promised Land, so I don't know. But the point is, God is going to do this, and it's going to be fulfilled in the millennium. And the point is, is that guy who's uh, lifting up his hand and swearing by him who lives forever, ever, is the Lord swearing by himself. Okay, This is a fulfillment of what's in Deuteronomy 32. So really get intimately equated with that song. That song in Deuteronomy 32, and again, this is, this is the part in my... Revelation book where I talk about the two witnesses. If you guys haven't gotten this book, I'm going to let you know when this next one is going to be out, but really get this book. It really is going to lay out in order these different prophecies for you, but you want to start to understand and read the Bible with these prophecies in order and stack them on top of each other in your mind and start going, oh, this is written after this and it's expanding on or expounding on this prophecy that was written before. And when you get to know the prophets like this, you're going to find out that amillennialism is ridiculous, preterism is ridiculous, and um, really, any when you when you get down to Jesus' words himself, anything but the mid-trib rapture is going to be ridiculous. Okay, they just don't have a leg to stand on. I don't know why all these people are are scared to you know have a conversation with me about this. Nobody will talk to me about this. No other no other pre-trib, pre-wrath, post-trib. Amillennial view will talk to me about this because they don't want to deal with what the scriptures say. They want to run to the scriptures and they want to go to their own arguments and their own imagination and say, well, why does God need to do it like that? And I'm like, because he chooses to. Why did he need to create the earth in six days? Because he chooses to. He didn't need to do anything. We don't follow a God who follows necessity. We follow a God who does as he pleases. And it pleased him to, you know, bring, bring Israel back and then have a millennial reign. And it pleased them to, to rapture people at the middle of the week. And if you get my book and you understand the wedding week and that whole scenario, you, it makes sense to you. And you're going to find out these things are in the Bible. But you don't approach this with your handful of verses in Daniel and your handful of verses 
in uh, the Gospels and your handful of verses in the book of Revelation and then a bunch of arguments that came from men out of their own imagination to try to dictate what eschatology is like. You come to me knowing what Isaiah said, what Jeremiah said, what Moses said in Deuteronomy, and that's your baseline. It is written, okay? These guys don't know how to do it is written, okay? So, uh, again, this is going into my book. I am uh, 208 pages done. I've got about 100 left to just re-edit, and then I'm going to release this again. Um, when I do a re-release, I just delete the old version. But like I said, if you've got the old version, it's the same theology. Um, I'm just always finding new nuggets and adding new things and refining things. And there's a few things in the church history section of this that I'm updating since I wrote a whole book on church history, and I know it a lot better now. So um, so anyways, I hope you guys are blessed by this. This is going to close off your... Um, your series in the five books of Moses. I'm going to lump all this together and just call it the Pentateuch on my playlist. And then um, I'm going to, um, when I get back from my trip, I'm going to start in on Joshua and um, probably start in on either Christendom 2.0 or an eschatology series to start off. So I'm going to stagger those, try to do one a week of each of those. So I hope you guys are blessed by this teaching and hope you have a great week and weekend. Batman out. Peace. Peace. I'm out. I'm Batman.